Let me invite you to be with me just for a few more moments in prayer. As we invite the Holy Spirit to have his influence in each of our hearts. What a great Savior we serve. Thank you, God. Thank you that you're here with us. Thank you that you're working. Thank you that you have sovereignly ordained this morning that we would gather together in your name. You know exactly where each person in this room is. And so we ask you to speak to us, each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Thank you, worship team. What a blessing. Such a joy to hear you all sing this morning. I, I, I have to admit, even driving this morning, it was a little bit disorienting for me. You know, I'm thinking that I had just come from North Carolina, where I was previously for 13 years, and um, as I drove in, as it began to snow and fog up, and I, I was just thinking, wait, isn't this like almost summer here? I mean, isn't that what we're, we should be anticipating? And I thought about is how driving in this kind of weather can remind me of really life, in a sense, a picture of where many of us are in life, where we, we find ourselves disoriented and a little confused. Uh, maybe for some of us, it, it would be like without the Lord, it's like driving with foggy windows when the defrost doesn't work. You ever been in a situation, like how many have ever had the privilege to drive with a vehicle where it's fogging up and the defrost doesn't work and you're having to reach up and wipe it? It's all right. There's no shame. It's all right. We're, I've, I've driven several of those vehicles along the way. Or you're, you're driving and you're having to reach up and it's, it's not real clear the road before you. In fact, it can even become dangerous. And life can be that way. And if you find yourselves in situations in life where you're just not clear about like, who am I? Why am I here? What, what is God doing? What, what, what is my life about? And it can be appear and feel much like trying to drive where the defrost doesn't work and you're trying to clear the windows. And then for others of us who have come to Christ is that we can find ourselves at times stuck in a second gear where we've come to know Christ. We've had this dramatic encounter with God where he's changed us and we've come to true faith in Christ. But somehow through circumstances, we find ourselves stuck in that lower gear and we just can't seem to get back up to speed. And you may be there this morning that it's been a while since you've sensed the Lord's filling and empowering and being gripped by his, his passion for the world around you and being overwhelmed with the grace of God and what he's done in your life. And so you find yourself stuck in that second gear. And for some this morning, where like you have, you've got it down in fifth and you're flying along and, and maybe part of this morning is just that you would get a, a fuel injection. There, there, you'd, you'd get a refuel of just getting the engine cleaned out a little bit and just being reminded of the love of God for you. So wherever you are this morning, I trust God has some very specific words for each of us. And so if you have a Bible, join with me in Mark chapter 14 as we continue on in Mark 14. The main idea is this, simply is this, as we go through the text this morning, the main idea is this, that you would know the love of God for sinners afresh. Know the love of God for sinners and the grace of God for saints. Now, some of you, I know from my background, you probably, I lost maybe some of you because you think, well, that's certainly not me at the end when you refer to what? Saints, right? But if you've come to know Jesus Christ, if you've genuinely born again, then scripture has given you another title and that title is a saint. It's not based on a clerical, unique group of people that recognize uh, some type of achievement of yours and they, they canonize you at some point in life. But instead, it's for those who've genuinely come to faith. And scripture refers to you as saint or set apart ones, that you've been set apart by the grace of God and have come into a relationship with him. And so again, the main idea, the purpose is that you would, as the, each one of you, to know the love of God for sinners, that you would be reminded of where you were apart from God's grace, or maybe for some of you where you are this morning and that God would be calling out to you. So know the love of God for sinners. And then secondarily is that you would, 
experience the empowering grace for saints, that you would know as believers to know the love of God for sinners and the empowering grace of God for saints, those who've been set apart for, by God. So what I'd like to do is we're gonna look at four simple questions as I go through the text. One of the things and benefits of working with, in a group of leaders in plurality at, at, here at this body is that we meet on Tuesdays typically, both as staff um, as well as some elders that can make it, and we open up and we share our outline. We share we're kind of where we're headed for the message, and they all kind of speak into it. And so one of the things that was brought up is really thinking through this basic questions of, well, four basic questions as we go through the text is, is what does it tell us about God? As we go through the passage, what we're going to look at is, I'm going to ask you, as we're reading through it, to ask the question, first and foremost, is what does it tell us about God? And then secondarily, in, in addition to that, is what does it tell us about ourselves, about you? Thirdly, is it, what does it tell us about the church? Not, not the building, but the people. That's the church, the people that are in it. What does it tell us about the church? And then lastly, how should I respond? Those four simple questions. The first one, again, is what does it tell me about God? As we read through the ta- text, and we're going to try to summarize, because we're going to cover the whole chapter, chapter 14. I'm going to summarize some different points, and we're going to dial in in some other aspects of, of chapter 14. So what does it tell us of God? What does it tell us about myself? And this is, should be normal Bible reading for each one of us as we're encouraged to be in the scriptures on a daily basis. What does it secondarily is telling me about myself? Thirdly, about us collectively as a church. And then lastly, how should I respond? So the first question as we go through, just keeping in mind each one of those and as we go through the text, starting in chapter 14. Now, the context of, of, of Mark 14 is in chapter 13, Jesus has talked about the end, about when he returns and what the end will look like. Part of that end will be an intense time of in persecution for God's people before the Lord returns a second time. And he's told his disciples of this. And one of the things he says over and over again in chapter 13 is be ready, be prepared, be on guard, because the persecution will be intense. Right on the heels of that, what you'll see as we go through Mark 14 is that you'll see those who are not ready, it's interesting how the Lord inspired, I think I was, as part of a staff team, we were talking, and Steve, who, who's the director of our children's ministry, I think he was helpful in just really pointing this out, is the contrast between chapter 13 and chapter 14, is that in chapter 13, the call is be ready, and in chapter 14, you see the disciples are what? Not ready. Not ready. And so as we go through this text, what you, again you'll see is this contrast. And then I submit to you really another truth that came as I've been studying through and reading through Mark over and over again. is one of the truths I think I hadn't seen before, and I've taught through Mark years ago and spent a fair amount of time in the book, is that one of the things I saw this time around that I hadn't seen before is in Mark chapter 8, the book kind of culminates in Mark 8. It's this high point in Mark 8 where you see that Jesus reveals who he truly is. So the true Jesus and what it means to have true faith, is he reveals himself as he truly is. And, and then he says to them, if you want to come after me, if you want to have true faith, he tells them what that looks like. You must deny yourself. Inherent within that repentance where you turn and believe in Jesus, you put your faith on the cross as you look to him. Is it inherent within that is this denial of self. It's, it's what scripture calls repentance. It's this change of mind. It's you no longer live for yourself. You're not the focus as scripture talks about in 1 Thessalonians 1, is that they turn from idols to serve the living and true God. That inherent within saving faith is this turning, this, this change of mind. So in that is there's this, this turning, this change of mind, and then he says, so deny yourself, and then he says, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to gain his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus speaking, my sake, will gain it for, and would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? So what he's describing is true saving faith is this, this giving of yourself when you turn from self-focus, self-rule, and you believe in Jesus, and he's your focus. You deny yourself, you lose yourself for his sake, and as in Mark chapter 34 says, for his sake and the gospels, his mission, his story. That's inherent within true saving faith. For each of us that we would understand that that's the call so what I believe he goes on to unpack in chapter 14 is it what does it look like to be ones who take up our cross and follow him? Well, what does that practically look like? And I think chapter 14 gives us a real good picture from Jesus' life 
of what that looks like. Inherent within true saving faith is this call to lose our lives for his sake in the Gospels. And I believe as we go through this, we'll see some characteristics for that as well, as he helps us understand the way of the cross. What does it really look like? So in chapter 14, join with me. And he says this, and it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, just real briefly, this feast of the Passover goes way back to 1400 some B.C., And that feast was commemorated when Jesus led his people, God led his people, out of Egypt, this place of bondage, after 400 years of being, they were in bondage out of Egypt, and the the crowning act of that release was this known as the Passover, where God said this, is as he says it, that I want you to take a lamb, and I want you to to go ahead and kill the lamb and put the blood on the, the front, the top of the door and the sides of the door. And when that evening, when that angel of death comes through the land, is it'll pass over those who have the blood. But those who don't, the angel of death will take the firstborn male, will kill the firstborn male. There'll be judgment upon that household. Death will come. And so for those God's people who have the blood, the of the lamb on their doorpost, and even that kind of a symbol of what? Of the cross, right? Passed over their homes. And so this became, a, in a sense, a crowning act of, and also really a birth of a nation came out of this Passover because they came out of that place of bondage and they went in toward, after a 40 year delay, in toward the promised land. Now, as part of that ceremony is that they had unleavened bread. It didn't have time for the bread to, to go ahead and cure it or, or to, to go ahead and, and there's a term for it. And what is the term? Rise, rise works. Um, so rise. And so in that is that it was unleavened. And so they had to, they took that and, and that became part of the ceremony in remembering what God had done. And these feasts were combined. They were, they were interchangeable by the time that Jesus comes on the scene from what I read is that these were interchangeable. It was an eight-day feast. And it began with the Passover. It began with the Passover, the sacrifice. What we're looking here in Mark chapter 14 is Wednesday, and Jesus is going to be crucified on the Passover on Friday. This is what we're looking at here. So just to give a little historical context. So So we see here that the chief priests and the scribes, those who were religious leaders, were again seeking how to arrest him, Jesus, by stealth. In other words, they wanted to do it secretly because here in Jerusalem at this time, at this Passover feast, you had millions of people, arguably about two million people from what I can understand, that would come into Jerusalem. And so this place would be be overwhelmed with with folks and, and people. And many are from Galilee where Jesus is from. And so they've come into the community. Jesus is popular there. They recognize that. Jesus did many of his miracles there. And so what they're saying is that they wanted to do it secretly. They, the text is telling us, Mark is telling us, that this is something they wanted to do secretly because they understand that it would cause an uproar, that the people would have opposition. And so this is Wednesday, verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard very costly, and she broke the, fast, the flask and poured it over his head. Now, what's happening here is it's about two miles from, from Jerusalem. It would be as if maybe from here to the freeway, approximately from here to the freeway from Jerusalem is Bethany. So Jesus, as he had done previously, he has left Jerusalem and he's now at the home of Simon. And while he's there is this woman comes forth. And we have a couple of accounts of this woman, very special account because she's this act shows up in four of the different or all of the different gospels this woman comes and she comes to jesus and she breaks open this flask this very expensive perfume and she anoints them jesus with this perfume now some have argued that maybe this is two separate people because based on on the other accounts there seems to be a question of chronology of like and, and one is is referring to a Simon, a Pharisee, and, and so we con- might be a little bit confused with that. Maybe there, there's some connection with Simon. Um, also, the question of, of one is that a woman comes in, anoints his feet, and wipes his feet with her hair. And so there's a question of the place and the how and the, the manner. But I really believe that the essence of it is, is that it's really one person. It's, we're getting what's going on from four different angles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all giving an account of what's happening here about this woman, Mark, the emphasis in Mark was not to point out, like in Matthew, that this was Mary of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That was not the motivation. 
It was specifically to kind of give you a running movement toward the cross. So Mark is kind of fast and furious. He's kind of, as we're heading through toward Jesus. So I, I think that, that if this was the second act of anointing, it was, if it was a different woman, then the scriptures would have told us that. Also because Jesus seems to highlight that is it's one woman that's going to be remembered throughout all history. So most likely this actually happened five, well, four days previous on the Saturday. Most likely this happened. Again, Mark's point is not to be precise so much chronologically as he's thematically pushing us toward this true faith in the true Jesus and how it culminates at the cross. That's the, his motivation. And so scripture at times is inspired by God, it's by the Holy Spirit, is will inspire the writers to put it certain ways to emphasize certain things. And so here we see the emphasis is not so much on the, who this woman is, but what she does. Very unique woman. So she comes forth. This woman with this alabaster flask of ointment, very expensive, very costly, and she pours it over his head. And there are some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like this? And he talks about that this is 100 denarii. So this would be about a, an average day laborers was a denarii. So about a, almost a year's worth of work for the average laborer in the community, right? And so there... And we see from the other accounts, this was led by Judas. Now, Judas was the treasurer of the group. He kind of kept the books, so to speak, or the money, kept the money purse. And John tells us that his motivation was not noble. What was his motivation? Greed, Greed because he, was, he had his hands in the dill, so to speak, or till. He, he, was, he was one that was taking advantage, and he was stealing. Scripture tells us that he was stealing, on the other accounts, from the money, and so this wasn't a noble thing like, wow, you should be more noble. Um, Jesus, you're not caring about the poor as if he could indict Jesus that way, right? But instead he was actually being selfish. And so Jesus says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She is a beautiful thing to me for you will always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So we see this beautiful act of sacrifice. This woman takes what she has, very expensive, costly perfume, and she anoints Jesus. He's told them from other, the other account in Matthew that I'm going to be crucified in two days. And so we know this to be the case. He's told them and on a few different occasions I'm going to be crucified, but specifically in the context he's told them I'm going to be crucified in two days. So what happens is that we see this ceremonial act of this woman coming forth and pouring forth and anointing Jesus' head for burial. So with this, again, looking to the crucifixion as we continue through now, is that Judas, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray to them, portray Jesus to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So this is blood money. He's going to deliver them up to Jesus and he sought an opportunity to betray him. So what's happening here in the text is that, is that you have, just let me give you some, an overview of just kind of events. So just again, be, because of time, is that the chief priests want to kill Jesus. They want to do it secretly. There's a, a he's popular. The, it's during the Passover. They don't want to have a big opposition to this. This woman comes forth and displays this beautiful act of, of sacrifice. Again, I think in part what we see an example of is that this taking up our cross and following Jesus involves personal sacrifice, involves personal cost. We'll see this unfold as Jesus demonstrates that in his own life the rest of the book. So we see this woman anoints Jesus. Then Judas makes plans. He says he makes plans in the text to betray Jesus. He's going to be the main guy that turns, and some of you may not be familiar with Judas, but he was one of the original 12. Jesus knew from the very beginning that he would be the one that would betray him. And this man, Judas, is going to be one who betrays Jesus and turns him over to the authorities to have him crucified ultimately. Scripture goes on to talk about then in verse 17 through 26 is that there is, they have then a meal together. And this is where the Lord's Supper is instituted. This is when we talk about what we'll enjoy together on Friday, but we have the bread and the cup, is that Jesus institutes it here. The old covenant is transitioned to the new covenant of, his, of the body and, and of his blood that is shed that's commemorated in the meal. The Passover meal is really a culmination of the old covenant, of the old agreement that God had from, 
1400-some BC of his people yearly gathering to celebrate what would look toward the, this Messiah, this lamb who would ultimately be slain. Jesus then here in Mark chapter 14 is gathered with his disciples and he institutes the new covenant, this new arrangement that it's not just the sacrifices that look toward his, his ultimate act of the somehow dealing with man's sin through the blood, which had been done through the blood of lambs, but now how God himself would be the ultimate lamb who, who would be die, one who would die on the cross. We see in, in John chapter one, the, one of the first things that John the Baptist does, he looks at Jesus and he says, behold the what? the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That Jesus was to be the culmination. He was to be the one that would be sacrificed for our sins. And he would then go ahead and be one that would fulfill all of that which had been, been sacrificed year after year. Symbolically, as if I was a family um, back in, in Jesus' day, I would have brought my lamb to be sacrificed. They, they, would have, they, would have went, they would have shed the blood of that, been applied on the altar. I would have taken that that body of that lamb back, and I would have roasted it and had a Passover meal, which is what they're celebrating here together with his disciples. Uh, he, we see in verses 17 through 26, they're celebrating the Passover meal. And Jesus is fulfilling that. He's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. It all culminates here in the, the Lord's Supper that we are called to commemorate continually is, is, is at the root word is the, from the Latin is this, what we have in our English is the word memory. It's to me, remo, remember, rem, memorialize. It's to be remembered, commemorated. And so that's why we are ones that daily are to remember. And then weekly we celebrate that or monthly in, in the case of Crossway Fox Valley. Once a month we gather together for the Lord's Supper. Other crossways where I previously served, we did it weekly. But as we serve here together, as we say, we remember what Christ has done. So he institutes it here. He, we see this Passover meal with his disciples. And then part of that then is he releases Judas. Judas is released. He's released to go and betray Jesus. Jesus foretells of Peter's denial in verses 26 through 31. And then in verses 32 through 42 is that we see the going to the garden of Gethsemane. Now, when Jesus communicates to Peter that he's gonna be, that he's gonna deny him, is what does Peter do? Now, Peter's the leader of the 12. What does he do? Peter says, no way, Jose, right? He says, no. He says, this is not going to happen. In fact, he, he goes ahead and, and he says emphatically, you see in verse 31, Peter's response, as Jesus says, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, Peter. And he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. Yeah, me too. Okay, so you see this picture. Now, Again, is that we're going to have to ask ourselves the question is, what, what does this tell us of God? And what does it tell us of ourselves? Because who are we in the text? Apart, apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our lives and empowering grace, who are we in the text? We're the disciples. We're Peter. We're making these declarations. Lord, we'll never deny you. And they all go, yeah, we'll never deny you, Jesus. And what we see shortly is that it's exactly what happens. In fact, as you go through the chapter 14, I've asked myself the question, is it, why does it include this here in the text? Why is there that the disciples are portrayed rather poorly, right? They come across it rather poorly in the text. They deny Jesus. We have one picture of one of them, most likely it was John, that actually flees in the face of opposition and they grab his robe and he flees naked. I'm like, why does it include that in inspiration? It kind of makes them look really like foolish. And, and if it wasn't so serious, it would be comical, right? I mean, if it wasn't so serious, the fact that he's denying the Savior and running away for his own safety in the face of denying Jesus, is it, it, we would laugh about it. Well, I think one of the reasons is because, remember, this is not the whole picture. It, it points to the crucifixion, which is going to happen in two days. It's what we'll celebrate on Good Friday, this Friday. But what happens then shortly thereafter is that as Jesus rises Easter morning, right, is that he comes back, and then as he, what we'll see within a month and a half or so is we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming and the church's birth, and we see a rare, very, very different group of disciples, don't we? They're no longer weak and inadequate and no longer stumbling along. Here they're looking like almost like a bumbling group of, of disciples. You know, they're like, hey, we'll never deny you, and yeah, yeah. And the next thing you know, they're running away, and they're, you know, one's running away naked, and, and it's just they're denying, and they're, it's just, they, they seem like this bumbling group of, of disciples. And I think there's a couple reasons for that as we're going through the text. Is what does it tell us about God? Is this the amazing love of God for his people? Did Jesus know 
that this was going to happen to his disciples. Absolutely. He already told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, twice. So he knows that of them. And he even tells them, but when you come back, he says, is remember, is, is feed my sheep. He's, he, he has this picture of restoration toward Peter. And I want to encourage you as, as believers of the grace of God, that we are to be people that understand that this empowering grace of God is that apart from Jesus, we're all a bunch of bumbling kind of foolish people. And we make a mess of things. And we need the Savior. And we need the Holy Spirit every single day. Because we see in Acts chapter 1 is that he tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon you, will give you power to be my witnesses. You're not going to deny me. You're not going to run away foolishly. But instead, you'll be one that are empowered by God's grace. And so one of the applications for us as believers is to understand how do we tap into the Holy Spirit? How do we depend upon the Spirit of God daily in our lives to proclaim him, to be a part of God's great story, to lose our lives for his sake and the gospels. What does that really practically look like? And so when we, we come to look at these pictures of, of God's love for sinners and what does it practically look like, shortly we'll see this underscored really again in Gethsemane where he's in the garden. He asks him to pray with his disciples. He pulls three of his most trusted leaders of the group of 12 and as they gather in this garden to pray, he's praying f- for strength, as he faces the crucifixion, he knows what's ahead. And he, he's asked his disciples to pray, but what happens to his disciples? They fall asleep. They fall asleep. This is what we see in verses 32 through 42. And so they come and they're, they're sleeping. Their eyes are heavy. And he says, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? This is verse 41. It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. And then there is Judas with a huge crowd, with swords and clubs, the chief priests and scribes, and they take him. Jesus is betrayed by Judas with a kiss. They seize him, put him under guard. And so we see this picture again of the love of God that Jesus, knowing his disciples will fail, fail miserably. He's asked them to pray. I, I think in one reality, one maybe characteristic of those who lose their lives for his sake in the gospels of true saving faith is this persistent prayer. Not only by the woman who, who has personal sacrifice and giving of the perfume, but also this persistent prayer, knowing that, that as believers we're called to pray. We are desperate for God's grace every single day. And so we see this parallel. I think as we go through this passage, there's so much that God is doing in the text. But again, just to underscore the main purpose of what I'm submitting here is to know the love of God for sinners, to understand that truly to know the love of God for sinners and his empowering grace for saints, that we need Christ every single day. Because again, that's not the end of the story, but we'll see again as we go through the book of Acts that God's spirit comes upon them and they they are rather very, very different people. So Jesus is betrayed. We see the example of the young man who flees, verse 51, and a young man followed him with nothing but linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, So, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So most likely, I've, I've heard this is probably John, so he's, he's following Jesus and they recognize him, they grab him and he s- slips out of it and runs away naked. I mean, even why does God include that in the text? I think in part, maybe in part also when we go to the second question, what does it tell us about ourselves? Is maybe the, in part again, is the inadequacies of the human will, the weakness of the human will left to itself. You say, I'm going to follow Jesus, just, just by will. But say, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus. And, and yet, see, we see these pictures of those who were with Jesus for three years plus, And yet, in his greatest hour of need, what do they do is they, they deny him and they flee. They abandon him. They're underscoring the inadequacy of, of the left to ourselves. We, we don't have what it takes to follow Jesus. Left to ourselves, we don't have the power to follow Jesus. We're needy. We need God's will. The, the inadequacy of the human will to say, by golly, I'm going to make it happen. And maybe you're, you find yourself in life too as you're in, in the Christian life. You're saying, you know what? I, I'm going to will myself. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to, I'm going to deal with this sin. I'm going, to, I'm going to have more of a reflection of God's love for people. I'm going to be a part of his great story. I'm going to, by God, I'm going to share with people around me. I'm going to really pray. And we make all these, these decisions. And in reality, we see ourselves falter and stumble along. Well, it's, 
in part, I think that's really what God helps us understand is why the disciples are portrayed so poorly in the text in, in Mark chapter 14 is because left to ourselves, that's us. We'll deny him. We'll, we'll, we'll boast of, of what we think we can do and fail miserably. We will, by golly, determine a lot of different things about it. On the other hand, what he's showing us in contrast is what does it mean to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him is by the Holy Spirit's empowering grace is to see a life that's demonstrated by Jesus's life, a life that loves, a life that is given, a lot down, laid down for others, a life that is intentional and purposeful and sacrificial. And so in the next in verses 53 through 65 is that we see that Jesus is mistreated before the council. He's led to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together and Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire and now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death but they found none. For many bore witness of, against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And so these, all these false accusations are coming before Jesus and they're not making sense. And so they ask him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. And he goes on to verse 63. It says, and the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witness do we need You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as he's deserving to, to die of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him saying, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And then we see the example of Peter who denies him here. The one who had said, I'll never deny you. God, I, it, I'll face death for you. He denies him here. He's there before the servant girl and the high priest. He denies him three different times. And immediately, verse 72, it says, the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. And then we'll see as he goes on then to before the Pontius Pilate, he's delivered up and then crucified, which we'll look at on Friday. And so what I want to ask you to think about as we kind of tie this together in just a few minutes remaining, is that what does this, again, tell us about God? Secondarily, is what does it tell us about ourselves? So I'm going to ask you to just take a moment, turn in someone near you and say, what is it, again, what does it tell us about God that stands out in your mind? And then secondarily, is what does it tell us about ourselves? So take a moment. I'm just going to give you a few minutes and share what comes to mind. If there's no one near you, you don't want to talk, just listen. That's totally fine. Go ahead and do that. Okay, let, let me pull it together for a moment. And let me, let me ask you the question is, when we talk about what does it tell us about ourselves, I, I want to take a moment and unpack that. What are some of the things you came up with? We're not going to be able to do this kind of dialogue and interaction in the future. We'll get too big for this. But, but for now, it's, it gives us such a wonderful opportunity to mind down on this. Great way to learn if you want to impact people and trans, see transformation. Best way to do it by far. Um, so question for you is, um, what is this... In reality, what does this tell us about ourselves? What did you come up with? What is something you heard? Anybody, just what, did, what does this tell us about ourselves, this, this account, this chapter 14 of Mark? Thoughts? Self-preservation. Yeah, self-preservation is a powerful force, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, especially when we feel like it comes in the form of like rejection, persecution. Okay, others. What does it tell us of ourselves? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Without the Holy Spirit, we just don't have what it takes, right? It's, it's not based on self-will and by golly, I'm disciplined, but it's going to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, right? Where he says, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do some things. He can do okay. You can do what? Nothing, right? We're desperate for the Holy Spirit, right? We need to, to lean on him. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be empowered by him. Now, how is that going um, Let me jump a little bit, and then we can jump back as well. But to ask the question is, how will that affect how we interact as a church body? If we know that left to ourselves, we're all desperate, all desperados, desperitas. Um, so wh whatever the case is, if, if we're desperate, 
people, then how will that affect how we relate to each other? And we all need the Holy Spirit to live this Christian life. I mean, all of us need to be empowered by the grace of God. As we're, if we're saints, we need to be empowered by the grace of God every day. Or we'll blow it, we'll mess it up. How will that impact how we relate together? Yeah, please, Courtney. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we know ultimately it's God, right? It's God is the one, and left to ourselves, none of us have what it takes. So like, what are we protecting? I mean, if we all know it, it has to be God in us, or we blow it big time, then, then what are we protecting? This week I had a chance to interact with a gentleman. He's not a young man either, um, a successful individual. And, and he shared with me, and I hadn't seen it, interacted this person on this level for you know, quite a while. And, and I, he shared with me how he had started to smoke pot. He's a believer, started to smoke pot. He was in California, started to smoke pot, and uh, how it, it just wound up becoming a huge part of his life every day, throughout the day. So initially, you know, just to relax from time to time, take the edge off of work, pretty hard worker. Uh, it's legal in California. So, hey, it's, uh, you know, that kind, of, that kind of rationale. And we discussed later some of the, the, the wrong thinking there. And, and one of the things he said, is, I just felt so much shame. I felt so much shame. And, and it was just so important for him to understand that, you know, it, as, as believers with repentance and forgiveness, there is no shame. When you confess and repent, now, that should lead us, there should be a sense of guilt, right? We're disobeying the laws of the land, we're not walking in the spirit and say we're controlled by some other thing, chemical, right? And so we, that's disobedience to God. And so it was important to help him understand is that, you know, it's repentance. As a believer, genuine child of God, he knew it. He could sense distance from the Lord. He felt like his life was topsy-turvy. He lacked focus, very focused guy, very successful guy. And for the last eight or nine months that he felt like it lacked clarity of what he was doing in life, God was disciplining him, Right? And I said, you know, and I said, you know, repentance can happen right now, right now, this moment with me, right now. A repent. And it can start, and you can draw a line in the sand, and you can walk in freedom. That doesn't have to define you anymore. Just applying the gospel when we know it's not by golly our self's will, and we're so disciplined, or hey, we got it together, you know. No, you don't got it together. Nobody's got it together apart from the Holy Spirit. He puts us together. He holds us together, right? And so all the focus is on him. And so we should have the relationships that Courtney refers to is that we go to each other. We need each other. I need people around me to come to me and speak into my life. I need people to speak truth to me. I, I need them to help me, remind me is, hey, you know, you're thinking wrongly about this. Or, hey, think about what God is saying here. How does the gospel fit in here in your life today? Are you believing for the power of the risen Christ to empower you to live differently? That you can love your wife over the long haul, the way God's called you to. Or you can love your, child, your children as they get up and go through these different stages in ways that don't frustrate you and you don't put them on a performance trip, but you can love them genuinely by the grace of God. Like, what does that really look like? Others, what does it tell us of ourselves or as a church? Let's go to the third question. Of what does it tell us about the church? Thoughts? Other, Clark, yeah. I knew that. I'm joking. I'm, jo I'm, I'm trying to say it based on what he said. You know, you guys missed it. Um, okay. So the, the point is that, yeah. Huh. Um, <laughs> the, the, the point is this, is that what Clark was saying is that we don't posture ourselves. Like, I know that, or, or hey, I got that wired. Or, but it's, it's, all, man, it's all level. It's all level. We're not going to pretend to be people we're not. So there should be humility, Clark said, a humility about our lives with each other. That, and as people come to me, I shouldn't go like, well, like, who do you think you are? What about the log in your eye? You know, it's not like that. It's, it's like, well, hey, you know, I need you in my life. And even if it's kind of ugly or, or not as smooth or as nice as it, you want it to come your way, right? Because we're making efforts. And so let's encourage each other and give each other a lot of grace as we come to each other, even if it doesn't come exactly the way it should. You know, because Galatians says in gentleness and reverence, Galatians 6, 1 and 2, first looking to ourselves, 
but honor the effort and the love, even if it's a little bit ugly first. And, and we'll learn, we'll, and I know we, many of us have, have, have been committed to this, but as a body, let's keep growing there, right? To be able to speak and encourage each other, especially reserved middle Midwesterners, very reserved, more private compared to like the West. Is we're kind of a little bit more insulated in our lives, a little bit more private, like who, who? And so we need to be able to, as a Midwesterner, is that we need to be able to go to each other and speak into each other's lives and encourage each other. It's not like, hey, who do you think you are? What, what? It's none of your business. No, it is our business. We're, we're family, right? We're family. Others, other thing that stands out when it comes to um, how, how it helps us understand ourselves or how we should understand the church. And let me, uh, Steve, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Others. Yeah, Marcy. And as we're doing that, we're practicing giving grace by God mm-hmm. and giving love. Yeah. So I- as we're interacting with each other and as we're transparent, that we, it's a conveying of God's grace that we've received to extend that same grace. Um, I just think about in my own life is that, is that if I'm saturated with the gospel each day in my own life, then, then it allows me couple things. Number one, it empowers me because I've resurrected power to live in newness of life, right? Scripture says I've been united with Christ, not only in his death, but in his what? Resurrection, right? Colossians 3, this new life. I have the power to say no to sin and walk in newness of life. And that's why there's this transformation. And that's why as we look ahead, you know, you may be on your fifth marriage, um, but the reality is, is that there should be no more divorces ever, ever, ever in the body of Christ, for those who are here are part of this body. No excuse, no, no reason, because we have the power to walk in newness of life. We have the capacity to say, you know, I can love one person for a lifetime by God's grace. You may have catted around and you may have a terrible history, but if, as the Holy Spirit empowers us each day with this resurrected power that we'll talk about next week, Easter, right, is we have the capacity to live differently. That's, that's this whole thing about going to the cross is that it, it, it not only brings us to Christ and secures us and saves us, which is the most important thing, right, but then it empowers us to live differently. It, it, it empowers us as saints to live as those set apart by God. That's why we need each other. That's why we need to move toward each other, remind ourselves of truth, and how do you apply that truth appropriate to your life that you live differently, that as people get into your home and, and they can see your life and see a difference by the grace of God. Others, other things stand out as we think about the text. What does it tell us of ourselves or of the church body as, as believers? Anybody else? Think about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, what a great question. Without the Holy Spirit, what would the church look like? What a great question. Because on one hand, what you bring out is that it looked much like the world, right? You look at the news, what's happening in the world, the church would look like that. But I would add another question, or another, maybe another side of that, is without the Holy Spirit and dependence on understanding the grace of God, it looked like a lot of churches in America, frankly, that are very, very legalistic, performance-driven, um, uh, very... Uh, and there's all this secret sin going on, all this immorality, but it's under the surface. And then it blows up and you wonder, well, why did, like, what, like what happened to this pastor who was so righteous, who was having these affairs behind all the scenes, right? I mean, you know, it would have looked a lot like legalistic churches. 
that are performance driven and very private, but then very judgmental and arrogant and that that and yet you know the grace of God as believers is we there's a humility and a transparency that should come from this as, as we look ahead. And, and as God works through Crossway and we reach more people through this body, things are going to look very messy at times. People from all different places. And, it's gonna, and praise God, if it's not messy, there's a problem. That means you're not reaching people, right? Um, or we're all pretending to not be who we really are. <laughs> and so we all need the grace of God. Every single one of us need God's grace and so what does it tell us about the church and, 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 and part? And then lastly is how should I respond? How should I respond? As a believer, let me submit to you primarily of, of how you tap into the Holy Spirit, which we, because we, again, this, this would make no sense without chapter two of Acts, where the Holy Spirit comes into us, right? Is that it's, it's a yieldedness to say, Christ, you be on the throne of my heart and my life. It's a yieldedness. So it's free from con- unconfessed sin, so we confess our sins and we yield by faith to the filling of the Holy Spirit. As the word of God is filling our minds and hearts, then we can walk in the Spirit and not carry out the desires of the flesh. So we can be ones that, behind the scenes, there's a transparency and a grace of God that is developing in our homes, in our, in our dorm rooms, in, in our neighborhoods of the grace of God that's genuinely working, that's replacing fear and anxiety, and manipulation. It's this work of God's grace in our lives. And then also, let me submit to you, for some of you um, who may not know Christ, it liberates you if you feel trapped. Because some of us are in situations with habitual sin, um, or in life where we just feel trapped. And, and I was reminded this morning in a very comical way of how desperate that could feel. You know, I'm, um, I have a new vehicle, and that's, that's a first for me. And I have a new vehicle, and I was, I was out in the parking lot. Some of you might have heard it this morning. I was out in the parking lot early, and uh, the worship team had already been practicing in here. And um, I was meditating on my message, and I had taken the keys out of the ignition, which I had, and was sitting there, and I had placed them there, and I was meditating on the message. And I made the mistake of then trying to get out the car door after being there for an hour. Do you know what happened at that moment? The alarm went off. And it locked me in, and I couldn't find my keys. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, taking off my coat, and I'm, I mean, can you imagine the alarm going off? And it's pretty early, you know, and, and I don't want any negative association with the church, you know, like, what in the world's going on over there at 7 a.m., you know, whatever, or 8 a.m. is, uh, and so I, I, so in that, I just thought like, you know, wow, what a, what a wonderful picture for me of what it means to feel trapped, because some of us, are in that place. And if we're not there, we know others who are. That they feel trapped and they're, they can't find the key to get out. They can't find the key to unlock that. And, and if the chances are, for 95% of you, if it's not you, there's somebody in your life that does feel trapped. And you know the Savior. You know the one who is intentionally gone by the way of the cross, looking to the cross, resolutely went to the cross out of a love for God for them. A love of God for sinners. And then by God's grace, the grace of God for saints, that they can have new life in Jesus. He's the only one that can get them out of that trap, confusing place in life. And so the encouragement is, let's take the good news to them. And, and let me challenge you this week to take th- to three names, three names to pray for every day this week and invite them to join us Easter morning. Invite them to join us. There's three names. Say, I'm going I'm to invite these three people. Pray for them all week as you invite them. And then let's see what God does as we celebrate Good Friday, um, Friday evening together, as well as Easter morning as we celebrate his resurrection And let's fill this place by faith as we step out and say, Lord, we know your mercy. You've given us purpose. You've given us life. Now this message of the cross is our message and we're losing our lives for your sake and that message of death and resurrection for the good news for people that need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as the worship team makes its way to the front? And let me just encourage you, just take a moment. Say, Lord, what is one thing you want me to walk away with? What is one truth that you want me to take hold of? God doesn't want to leave us in a place disoriented where 
where the window and the car are fogging up and the defrost doesn't work, but he wants us to have clarity to know who we are and why we're here and where we're going because the grace of God. And so that comes in simple faith. See, Lord, save me a sinner. Lord, give me eyes to see the truth of your gospel. I want genuine faith. I want to be born from above, born again, true life with you, Lord. I want your spiritual life. Lord, I don't want to counterfeit. I don't want to get religious. I want you. And so in simple faith, just say, Lord, I want you. I want to, I reach out. I believe in you. Lord, you died for me. You, you were treated as if you were me when you suffered in my place on the cross that I might be treated as you lived without sin. That great exchange. And so, Lord, give me eyes to see, a heart to believe. For us who have known that mercy and that grace of God, ask him to rekindle a heart that's, that is passionate for Christ, that is focused, that's not stuck in second gear but moving toward his purposes with, with a spirit-filled enthusiasm, in theos, enthusiasm in God. Would you ask him to rekindle that in your heart, that first love? And for some of us this morning, we, we've known his mercy today and this week, and be remembered. Be, re remind yourself of the love of God. Wait out afresh into the ocean of his love for you that wasn't affected based on your performance this week, but was settled at the cross 